Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for that wonderful uh, uh, introduction. Uh, and it's a great honor to be here, of course, and uh, to be part of the McKenzie uh, lectureship tradition. And I want to add my thanks to the McKenzie Committee for the hard work that they put into making this evening possible. Um, it is a little daunting speaking here, and um, I'm re recalling that my father, who was a minister, used to uh, periodically remind me that a prophet is without honor in, in he would say, his own land. And, um, so I will uh, do my best to try to at least, uh, I, I don't know, accumulate a little honor this evening. Um, I want to make sure this is all working. I'd like to start here. Uh, this is the bait shop that was next door to the house where I spent the first few years of my life in the rural western Nebraska. Um, the family of the bait shop owner lived in the back of the house uh, and they had a television set. And uh, my mother has told me uh, recently, actually within the last 20 years or so, that the reason we got a television set was because I played with the little boy next door and I spent too much time over there and they didn't think he was a good influence because they sold beer at the bait shop and so we got a TV set uh, kind of prophylactically. <laughs> um, now, uh, what I remember is, is instead of me watching TV, I remember my father coming home from church at, for lunch at, at, at noon so that he and mom could watch The Edge of Night. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but of course, as most families in, in the 50s, you know, we also took advantage of the other things that were on television. The Lawrence Welk Show comes to mind. Uh, and later on, when mom and dad would be at prayer meeting Wednesday night, uh, my sister and I would watch things like the uh, Dick Van Dyke Show, which I remember very warmly from those times. Um, it was also a period of the emergence of the of the bathroom epic uh, films, and uh, and the night I remember in particular the 1954 uh, the 1954 uh, Cecil B. DeMille Ten Commandments. Many of you remember it as well. It's still a standard uh, Easter time on American television. Uh, there are many images and many scenes from the film that we remember we share culturally. A lot of people I know talk about this scene where uh, the Pharaoh's army is drowned in the Red Sea, um, and, or the, the lightning, you know, making the, making the images on the Ten Commandments. Uh, tablets. But what I remember most vividly actually from this film is this scene, and this is where the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, it comes down from heaven and smites the firstborn children of, e of Egypt. And the, the Holy Spirit is depicted as a green, blue-green cloud that comes down and flows through the town and, uh, and you hear people screaming and things like that. And to this day, when I hear, hear the term Holy Spirit, I have a hard time fighting that image. <laughs> And I think I share that with a lot of people, the way that media images, you know, come to interpose with our senses of ourselves. Um, but I was hooked on TV. My father tells me, told me when he would watch, he would come to the living room by watching TV, he'd say, you'll never make a living at that. And um, he's, he, he lived to admit that he was wrong. Uh, but I was a TV addict, and I spent uh, early years, some of my early years, exploring possibilities of a career in media. Uh, I went from uh, looking at media production to being involved in other aspects of media, including uh, children's television advocacy, um, working with the, actually with the United Church of Christ Office of Communication in New York on uh, media reform of various kinds, and developing, uh, developing a curriculum for media literacy for families and for children. But my, my real, uh, uh, I think my real uh, uh, passion was in the academy, and I went back, and after I got my degree, one of the first things I did was a study of televangelism. And you remember uh, Tim and, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker from that era. Uh, I wrote a book about televangelism. I also did a study of uh, religion uh, journalism that was published in this book, uh, and also conducted studies of how people make meaning out of the media they consume and how they interact, how their values, their religious values, and others play into their use of popular media. Uh, I gradually came to realize that my area interest in religion and media was, was ev evoking some kind of thoughts about larger kinds of consequences and frames, rather than just thinking about how 
the religion might use the media in the case of like televangelism or, or how the media might cover religion in the case of, of journalism or something like that, but instead that there were larger kind of forces and trends afoot. And I explored some of those a bit in, in the book Religion in the Media Age. Um, I think around, the, around the, the time that I was becoming more and more active as a scholar, um, I became aware of the fact that I was, I was beginning to, to, to feel that there had been kind of a cultural shift underway in the world of religion in relation to media. A um, uh, way to, to think about it is to say the question of, I began questioning the, the, the idea or through media seeing reason to wonder about sacrality, about what is sacred in the society, what is sacred in the culture, and where is that located. Um, uh, by the time that I, that, I, that, that I was sort of having those thoughts, I was thinking about that kind of shift taking place. Um, the shift that I was observing was, a lot, was well underway. And uh, as an example of this, not, not a lead, the leading edge of it by any means, but a, a kind of a testament to the times that had, in a way, already had, had already come into being. Um, this incident is one that I'll point to. <clears throat> 25 years ago now, this is in October of 1992, the Irish singer Sinead O'Connor appeared as the musical guest on Saturday Night Live. And Saturday Night Live's now been on the air 50 years, but in those days, Saturday Night Live was still one of the major uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, one of the major destinations of the youth audience in American television. Sinead O'Connor obviously is a very popular uh, artist, and in her final. Uh, set that night, musical set, she, she was singing a Bob Marley resistance song, and at the end of the song, she held up a photo of John Paul II, the Pope at the time, and, and said, fight the real enemy, and tore the photograph in half. Uh, this uh, led to an instant uh, kind of response. First, the audience, which didn't clap. Uh, the next week, she was booed off the stage at a Bob Dylan tribute concert in New York. Uh, the next week's guest host, the next week's host for Saturday Night Live, Joe Pesci, devoted his introduction to a really misogynistic, scurrilous kind of attack on her and on, and on her character. She had obviously gouged a sacred cow of some kind. She had identified where and what was sacred in the culture. This should have been deeply ironic because this is also the height of Madonna's career. Uh, for anyone younger in the audience, Madonna was a popular music figure at the time. Uh, you can, uh, she was sort of like the Lady Gaga of her generation. Madonna, if you may recall, had made a major industry of attacking Catholicism. Uh, she, you know, she was very obvious about her feelings of disquiet, her feelings of alienation from the Catholicism of her youth. Uh, this was a major brand for Madonna. Um, in 92, actually, is when she re had released the uh, Like a Prayer video, which uh, uh, you may remember um, was, was all about a kind of conference, conversation and confrontation with the church and what she saw to be the problems with religion and with uh, particularly with Catholicism. And yet, there was very little controversy about Madonna. The youth audience attracted to uh, attracted to uh, Saturday Night Live actually bought this. They liked this. They agreed with her. They were part of this resistive community against religion at the time. But Sinead O'Connor uh, had actually done something that really did scandalize them. And I think the important uh, transition here is, is kind of in two, on two levels. One of them is it, it was obvious from this how by that time the media culture, the popular culture, the public culture had become a place where what was sacred in society was obvious and was celebrated and was understood and was manipulated. It also was obvious, I think, that the reason that this particular figure, that is why the Pope could be sacred while the church's symbols were not, was also a media effect, in that the Pope had been made into a media figure. He had been iconified as, if, if you may recall, as it's kind of hard to remember now when we have Francis, who's so human and accessible, but that was also the stereotype that we had of John Paul II. He was very media savvy. He, uh, he had been an actor before he became a priest, so he really understood public performance. Um, and he used that uh, very effectively. And, and as I, again, as I say, became kind of an icon. So you had a, a personal icon who was accessible 
made accessible through the media, manipulated in this moment in mediation. And to me, that was symbolic of what I call the big picture. And this will be the theme of my, of my lecture tonight, is kind of talking about, talking around uh, what I see to be a shift in the location of religion from histories and doctrines and confessions uh, to the media marketplace of public culture. Religion is more and more now happening and being generated out in the media and in public culture. Um, my talk will have five uh, modules or five chapters. First of all, Converging Trends, Challenge to Authority, Religion Journalism, The Digital Revolution, and Media Imaginaries. First, Converging Trends. Um, and a, a way to look at this is, in, is to recall your McKinsey lecturer from last year, Diana Butler Bass, who talked about trends in American religion. And one of the ones she pointed to is one that's up in this chart from the Pew, uh, the Pew Research Group. I know it's a little small for you to see, so I'll tell you what it is. It's pointing to the percentage of the American public who claims to be unaffiliated, to have no religious affiliation. They're increasingly called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, not N-U-N, N-O-N-E-S, the nuns. It's now at about 22, 23%, and it is the fastest growing category of American religion. Each new survey of American religiosity has a larger percentage of people claiming none as their identification. Interestingly, it's the same in Brazil. It's almost exactly the same percentage. It's growing at almost exactly the same rate. Many countries in the world are seeing this, an increasing percentage of people who just don't identify with religion for whatever reason. These figures will also be hard to see, but I'll explain what they are. This shows that, according to Pew as well, currently only 36% of Americans claim to attend church once a week or more. Uh, the middle category is uh, once a year to several times a month, that's a huge category, and the uh, third category is almost never, so it's about a third, a third, a third. Comparing that weekly attendance figure with some other figures is interesting. This is the percentage of Americans who believe in God. 63% believe absolutely that there is a God. The second category, 20% who believe uh, that there is a God but are only fairly certain about it. If, it's, if you combine those together, 80-some percent of American, Americans are at least fairly certain there is a God. Um, this is the percentage of Americans who pray at least daily, 55% claim to pray at least daily. 59% uh, claim to at least once a week have a feeling of spiritual peace and well-being, being a kind of measure of spirituality. So you have this uh, distinction between religious practice, religious activity in conventional religious context, church, religious, the, the typical uh, aspects of faith practice, versus intense interest in religion, in the stuff, in the in the, the core of what religion is and what religion might be for people. Uh, so the converging trends I want to talk about are this decline, decline in institutional religion and the authority of institutional religion, um, and at the same time, a kind of rise in personal autonomy and personal action in religion and spirituality, what could be called seeking or questing. That is, seeking or questing, for example, by the people who claim to be spiritual but not religious. You've heard probably talk of that, and, and Diana talked about that quite a bit last year when she was here. Uh, so that you have an interest in and authority of religion declining, you have more individualism in religion, uh, and those things converge in many ways, but one of the ways and the way that's significant for us tonight means that that is generating a market for media material, media resources, mediated sources of insight and activity and, and involvement around spirituality, around religion, around belief, around faith. So the media, acting like they do, are generating material and supply to meet this demand that's occurring because of increasing Religion, uh, increasing non-religiously institutional activity uh, in, in, that we might call religious. Um, a watershed really in this provision of material was in the 1990s. Uh, it's hard to remember now, but before 1990, it was very unusual for any American television program to have religion as a theme or for there to be any, any mention of religion at all in primetime television. 
That changed in the 1990s with two programs in particular, with uh, first of all, Touched by an Angel, which you may remember, and Seventh Heaven. Both of those programs emerged in the 1990s. This is a point where a kind of a crossover happened. You had more, uh, more representation of religion in American popular and commercial media. Uh, that was followed by uh, other programs as well. 1990s is, of course, when Homer Simpson met God. That's what's happening here. Um, and the, the 90s also was a time when programs that in, in popular television that dealt with non-traditional religion and non-traditional ways of thinking and doing religion also emerged. Uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer on the left and Northern Exposure on the right, both very popular and both having religion, though not necessarily traditional religion, as an important part of their narrative structures. Uh, today, we accept it as almost a commonplace that films like Avatar, for instance, from, uh, from 2009, will be all about religion in a way. The whole narrative arc of Avatar depends on a certain kind of religion, spirituality, transcendent activity and transcendent consciousness, and its ability and its, its role in leading the social change. Um, religion is, you know, kind of continues to be everywhere. Game of Thrones, uh, this is a guide to the religions of Game of Thrones. Um, and this is a, a discussion board on a website where uh, people are discussing their favorite fictional religion, which media religion do they like the best. So the media sphere becoming, again, more and more of, a, of an inventory of material around religion. Um, I'll do a slight footnote here just to say one of the things that's helpful to think about in how, in explaining how the media can become so active in this is to think about things that those, we, those of us, uh, that we media scholars call media logics or media affordances, the way in which the particular characteristics of media that make them particularly prone to have certain kinds of effects or allow certain things, sorts of things to happen. Um, um, oh, one area of media logic that we look at a lot is in the area of aesthetics and sensations and spectacle. The fact that media are very good at being sensational and speaking to the senses, particularly the visual sense. And I'll do a little case study here to illustrate what I mean, starting with this picture. Uh, I'm sure you've seen this painting before. This is a uh, Warner Salmon's 1940 painting, Head of Christ. Um, it's in many ways the generic picture of Jesus that people carry around with them, both in the US and, and abroad. It's not very good art, uh, but the most important thing about it, I think, is, is the way that uh, Protestant authority responded to this, this painting. Uh, my father, who was a New Orthodox theologian, hated it. He took them, whenever he went to a new church and they had any, he took them off the walls and burned them. We couldn't have them at home. He just hated the vision. It related in part to an, a kind of suspicion of visual imagery that's, uh, that's endemic to Protestant theological thought. Uh, Protestantism, Islam, and Buddhism share in common. One thing they share in common is the suspicion of visual imagery and a suspicion that visual imagery will mislead you, that you have to have more of, a, of an intellectual approach to faith, otherwise it can be a misleading or an immature faith. The, the visual can, can allow you to have some sort of faith of a child rather than the mature faith of an adult. Uh, Catholics and others don't agree, obviously, Hindus. Uh, so uh, th there was a suspicion of the image. There's also a great deal of anxiety about the image because it's, it's clearly such a, it's, it's a Northern European image. It's, it, 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 there's a lot of things that are very off-putting about it, very exclusive about it. So for as long as I've been following these things, there's been a roiling debate about what, how to replace these iconic images of Jesus as an Aryan man with a beard with some different kind of image. So in, in 1999, uh, the, uh, the uh, magazine uh, National Catholic Reporter sponsored a contest to replace that image, replace it with the new image of Jesus. And here is the winning entry. Uh, and when this, was, when this was first released and circulated, some of you may remember this, I don't know, but at the time that this came out, I never saw any representation of the picture that didn't also have the cut line, that didn't also have the caption on it. 
So I'll read the caption. It says, it was called Jesus of the People. That's the name of it. Jesus of the People was painted by an agnostic who used a female model. You see many people in it, said Janet McKenzie, the, the, the artist. And you can see that it's a connect, concatenation of lots of religious references. You have the yin and yang symbol, symbol up on the left. You, it, it could be that the figure is in front of a stained glass window, and so it has a circle around the head that might be a halo. You have the, the Native American reference with the feather on the right. You have the fact that it could be a woman, could be a man, it's a person of color. Uh, it doesn't have the triumphalist Northern European uh, you know, uh, posture of the Salman image. It's, it's different, it's the non-Salman image. But in fact, it's an image that takes a lot of work. It, it takes a lot of work to consume that image. Because you, in order to understand what it's really about, you almost have to read the caption. You can't just look at it. In that way, it's bad media. This is an image that requires a lot to consume, whereas media are very good at doing things like that. It doesn't require a caption. You get it immediately. You understand what it's about. You can see there are two or three different claims made by this image. Uh, that is the way media work. They have, a, they have an ability to communicate to you on a level of senses and aesthetics that don't require the intellectualization that is required to consume this image. I want to talk about a second area of media logics. The media also have logics that are determinative in terms of media systems and in terms of media economics. And a way to get into this is to look at Martin Luther. When we think about Luther, Luther Lutheran Reformation, uh, we understand its relationship to the development of printing, the way we, we hear the history, the way we're typically taught the history, is that the effect of printing on the Reformation was in uh, increases in literacy, vernacular, uh, uh, vernacular theological reflection, circulation of books, etc. Uh, the historian of printing, Elizabeth Eisenstein, in her classic book on this in 1978, said that all of that misses a, a very, very important impact of the printing revolution. And that was the printing revolution allowed the development of the publisher, the publisher as an independent source of authority in the society. Someone independent from church, independent from state, who could float on their own economic bottom because they had the ability through the commercial enterprise of printing uh, to uh, pay their own way. Uh, and this set them up as an independent uh, challenge to the authority of other institutions in early modern Europe. The publisher is the media. That's the source of the media. This is the beginning of the media age. This is the very beginning of mass media. Uh, you can look at ways in which early printing uh, used and, and piloted many of the things we think of today as, as the gestures of modern media and modern mediation. So this is the beginning of media as a challenge to authority. So in my work on, on uh, the media and religious authority, I have I've, I've kind of identified what I see to be a series of ways in which the media are a natural challenge to religious authority today. Uh, no private conversations, religions use control over their own symbols, they become differentiated and branded, and they become relativized, and I want to go through each of these in turn. First of all, no private conversations. The media make it impossible for religions anymore to just talk to themselves. They can't create a sacred boundary around themselves. Uh, the Catholic Church has experienced this most vividly in relation to the pederasty scandals. As much as they would like to be able to keep that within, handle it within, and for years had handled it within, it's no longer and less and less possible for them to do that than, than, than in the past. And their impulse, frankly, is still to think of it that way, to think of this as a private internal matter. Uh, Post Francis himself actually let slip that kind of a sentiment last week uh, in a speech in Chile, that he still feels that way, that, that this should be something that should be an internal matter of the church, but it, that, that's just not possible anymore. When the media can do things like this, they can create a film that can win an Academy Award, which is all about the scandal which the church would like to keep uh, inside. Uh, Pope Benedict actually, uh, 
has a fairly sophisticated view of this challenge to church authority by the media. Benedict is, and other conservatives like Benedict, you may know, um, look at the Second Vatican Council, which many people have thought of as this great progressive turn by the church. They look at the Second Vatican Council as a mistake, as a wrong turn. Uh, and in his last address to the clergy of Rome, after he had resigned as Pope, Benedict made the following statements about the media and the Vatican Council, which happened in 1963. He said, in addition to the Vatican Council itself, there was also the Council of the Media. It was almost a council in and of itself, and the world perceived the council through them, through the media, the media interposing themselves in the church's business. So the immediately efficient council that got through, he's recognizing that media logic that I was talking about, the immediately efficient council that got through to the people, that was the council of the media, not of the fathers. And we know that this council of the media was accessible to all, another affordance or another characteristic to the media. So dominant, so more efficient, this council created many calamities, many problems, so much misery. In reality, seminaries closed, convents closed, liturgy trivialized, he might have gone on to say, guitar masses, you know, all the things that he hated about the Second Vatican Council. So Benedict would hate this picture, right? Which again is an example of kind of mass mediation, of a conification of, uh, of, uh, the, of the image of the new pope and the modern kind of progressive image of the new pope and being celebrated by the media. Uh, a second challenge to religious authority from the media is that, the, that authority lose, authorities lose control of their own symbols. So I'll bring Madonna back. Uh, in case you missed it, there were three religious symbols in these pictures. There's one in each picture. And as I said before, this is something the church can't do anything about. It's not possible for them to keep Madonna from doing this. And so they cannot control the places and the manners and the means by which their symbols are celebrated. This is significant, I think, in relation to theories about religion. This is the, uh, the uh, great uh, anthropologist of, of Afro-Brazilian traditions from the University of Manchester, Pablo Farias, who said, a religion that the definition, the very definition of religion is the ability to confirm and to control signs. As he said, is that religion is that which has the power to determine the meaning of, of signs. And if a religion loses the ability to say that this symbol means this and that symbol means that, and this one's sacred and that's not sacred, a good deal of what religious authority is about begins to fade away. In the media sphere and in the media age, religions are increasingly differentiated and branded in a kind of symbolic inventory. They're, all, they're part of a horizontal inventory of cultural products. They're no longer able to, they're not able to claim for themselves a kind of hierarchical authority uh, that gives them any special, uh, any special precedence in culture. Um, I've got a couple of images that are just metaphors for this to kind of illustrate what I'm saying. Religions find themselves very much like the, this uh, religious practitioner uh, who's put up an ad on a roadside in Ghana. He's there with Jesus, but he, there's also an ad for refrigerators, an ad for carpets, and an ad for a restaurant down the road and a bar across the road and that sort of thing. So religion finds itself in this horizontal marketplace of symbolic supply. Or in this case, this is a billboard advertising, a, advertising an amusement park that has a wax uh, museum connected with it. And there are a whole bunch of figures in the wax museum here. And among all of those figures are four religious figures. Um, in case you didn't know, can't, didn't, can't pick them out from there, uh, Elvis, uh, Edward from Twilight, uh, Michael Jackson, and the Pope. So four religious figures. But the point I'm trying to make here is that religion finds itself in kind of a bar buried in this marketplace with other symbolic imagery. And that means that religions are increasingly relativized. They can't, you know, they're relativized by these experiences. They, it, it, it makes religious authority relative. Uh, and uh, some religions will win and some religions will lose. And here's an example of the struggle of religious authority to kind of stand out. Uh, these are the bishops of the Methodist Church of Ghana. 
Ghana is an autochthon, Ghanaian Methodism is autochthonous. It's not connected. It's not a branch of US, not a branch of, Brit of British Methodism. It's an entirely autonomous Methodist movement. And the man in the inset is the presiding bishop of the Methodist Church of Ghana. And in 2013, he ruled that, or directed, that new vestments should be created for the Methodist Church of Ghana bishops. And they needed to be vestments that actually looked as important and as official and as churchly as Catholic vestments. And he was very, uh, he was very uh, articulate in saying the reason he was doing this was because in media framing, in photographs, in television coverage, the Catholic Church always looked more powerful because their vestments looked more powerful. So we need to have vestments like those. And so they made their vestments like the Catholic vestments. The only difference is that these are kind of cherry colored, whereas the Catholic vestments are more of a scarlet. Um, and, and I have an anecdote that kind of related to this, this man's particular sense of, of media framing. Um, Karen and I saw an ad one evening uh, for a revival in the north of Ghana. Uh, and it had four or five different preachers who were gonna be there, including the, the bishop. And the other four preachers were all Pentecostals and their little, advert, their little clips in the advert ad were all moving images of them with microphones preaching and you know, casting out demons and people being slain by the Holy Spirit. And the Methodist bishop's contribution to the ad was a still photo of him in his vestments. One of the students I was lecturing uh, worked in the communication department at the Methodist office. So I told him, I saw this. It seems to me that you you know, you should tell the bishop, you know, you guys need to have some video to put, you know, to make you compete with the really live action of the other churches in these ads. He said, oh, we got plenty of video. He won't use it. He thinks it's not authoritative enough. It's more authoritative to be seen in a still image with vestments on. Now he's wrong, of course. It's, it's, he's losing the battle, but you can see that he's very, very, very self-conscious about how to brand Methodism in an era when the media are becoming the uh, determinative uh, factor. Now this issue of the attack, of the, uh, not the attack, but the, the challenge to authority is not unique to Christianity. It's not unique to the West. I'll just, you can look at across a number of different contexts, but I'll just do a few images from Islam. This is Amr Khalid. Amr Khalid was uh, named by Time Magazine a couple of years ago as the, one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Uh, he's a Muslim televangelist. He is not a cleric. He has no religious training or theological training. He is a former advertising executive and he has created a global televangelism empire in Islam, very widely watched here in the United States by American Muslims, for example, for a more global, moderate, uh, accessible Islam, uh, very much against uh, the traditional, the, the conservative uh, Salafist uh, authorities in Islam. Uh, here's another example. This is Sheikh Mizo. He's another Muslim televangelist from Egypt. As you can see, he's gotten in trouble with the authorities by claiming that you, that by by claiming that you don't have to believe in Muhammad in order to get to paradise. This is removing the exclusivity that's so, been so endemic and there's so much at the core of, of Muslim theology. He's also said that. Um, Premarital sex is not fornication. It is a sin, but it's not fornication. Uh, he said that the hijab is not directed by the prophet. Um, and he's someone who can say these things because he has the platform of media and mediation. Um, this is another example that the Muslim authority can't do anything about. This is a film called Sheikh Jackson, which is the Egyptian entry, Egypt's entry in this year's Academy Award for Best Foreign Film. And it's about an imam in Egypt who is a, 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 a uh, Michael Jackson fan. And when Michael Jackson died, it led him to a crisis in terms of his existential understanding of death and his whole theology of death. And it's a, it's a film about his exploration of that, including images of a Michael Jackson dancer lookalike dancing during prayers in the mosque. And this is a kind of an image that Salafist authorities would not approve of, but in a way they can't do much about the fact that this kind of this sort of thing can happen uh, in in and through the media. All right, well that's uh, two chapters. We'll go to the third chapter now: religion journalism. This is an area a lot of us spend a lot of time thinking about, of course, and it's one of the ways that 
Most of us encounter the mediation of religion is through journalism. As I said, I did, this, I, I did research work on religion journalism. I published a book on that. And the, the uh, essential reality of the problem of religion journalism for religion, consistent with what I've already been saying, is that to exist, in the, to exist religious brands, religions, need to exist in the media. Some religions are more present than others. Some are more active than others. The Mormon Church, for example, has always understood this necessity of having a media face. But what are the challenges to this? And many of the challenges are rooted in the nature of journalism itself. So this is, uh, these are, I think, factors in the nature of American journalism that affect the way it covers and the way it treats religion. First of all, American journalism tends to assume a theory of secularization. It tends to assume that American history, world history, Western history is defined by a kind of unitary process whereby as people become better educated and become uh, more, uh, uh, have many of their wants met by increasing development, they will need religion less, religion will fade away. And in fact, a lot of the evidence kind of suggests that as people become more educated, become less religion, religious, there are a lot of reasons to, uh, to kind of be convinced by that idea of secularization. But nonetheless, that's a dominant frame for the media as they, and journalism in particular, as it looks at religion. They're expecting uh, religion to be part of old news, a more secularized society to be part of new news. Religion training and religion knowledge is not part of standard journalism training, either in universities or in on the job where most journalists learn their craft. There's then the phenomenon man bites dog. Uh, journalists, journalists will say, dog bites man is not news. Man bites dog is news. So there's the phenomenon of a kind of sniff test over what is newsworthy and what's not newsworthy. And things that are commonplace, taken for granted, happen all the time, they're not news. Things that are unusual are news. And if you think about it in kind of your sense of the way society should work, that's the way you'd like it to be. You'd like uh, it not to be news if things are going well. You know, that's the way you want things to be. Third, there's the fact that there are kind of guiding and shared narratives that determine, religion, determine coverage of everything in journalism, including religion. Um, a wag once said that the, that the New York Times motto, all the news that's fit to print actually should be all the news that fits we print. That is, things that fit these guiding frames make it things that run counter to those guiding frames don't make it. There's also a kind of, because there isn't formal training in religion, journalists feel much more self-confident covering police, covering business even, covering economics, covering fashion, things that they kind of have a commonplace understanding of. There's a real reticence about religion because they don't feel that they understand it or know it very well. And there's a tendency for, there has been a tendency in the past for journalism to treat religion with deference, to, to say that the way we think about religion is we don't want to look under its skirts. That's something that's gradually changed and it's the, the, the sexual scandals in the Catholic Church have been part of the reason why that deference has begun to decline, but there's still a, a tendency for that. There's also, frankly, um, a kind of a mythology in, the, in, in journalism, a fear of the wrath of God if they get it wrong. They're worried about religion as something other than the kind of rational things we normally work with, and if we, if we don't do it quite right, what will the consequences be? Uh, as one journalist told me, uh, who should remain nameless, but her initials are Judy Woodruff, uh, it's, there are just so many of them. There are just so many of them. And that's a problem with religion. It's kind of a multivariate context, set of contexts. And the, um, and the, the uh, standards of journalism and journalistic objectivity are kind of rooted in, um, an, in a, 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 a kind of structure of stories where you, where you cover two sides. That is, as long as you have an advocate and someone who's opposing the advocate for something and you give them both airtime or you cover them both, you've been objective. And religion is not something that's easy to cover in that uh, two sides kind of way. Uh, so religion tends to get covered when it looks like other things. Um, and uh, 
we're having a bit of, tech, a bit of technical difficulty here, and so the key point I wanted to make is hidden in the bottom of the slide, so I'll have to read it to you. Um, religion gets covered when it looks like other things. Sex, I have sex, violence, money, and hypocrisy. And those tend to be the things that get religion news, is when a story can be about sex, violence, money, or hypocrisy, particularly about hypocrisy. And then the other uh, tendency, the other trend that we've seen in religion news in recent years has been an increasing tendency for there to be increased, be more coverage of religion, but as a soft news uh, uh, item, as a soft news story. Um, religion can be thought of as legitimate and authentic if it's expressed as the authentic and legitimate feelings and expressions of individuals and their personal experience not religion covered in terms of its structures or its institutions or its political implications or relationships. So what this means is, I think, that there are some big stories that are not covered very well. Um, there's a, a great deal of journalistic attention to the relationship between Donald Trump and the, and the evangelical voter, but th those, those still tend to be uh, fairly simplistic readings of who these various communities are who are supporting them. Uh, in the last election, uh, the, the media did not know what to do with whether Hillary was religious or not, or how to handle that, in spite of the fact that she was very, uh, so, very, uh, you know, very uh, uh, self-revealing about the extent to which uh, she had a faith tradition and a faith background, and she was uh, was quite explicit about that. Um, a big uncovered story in religion that's covered just very few places, for instance, Al Jazeera is where this came from, uh, is, the, is a parallel situation to the relationship between religion and the Trump administration and religion and the Putin administration in Russia. The role and the place of the Orthodox Church in supporting uh, and in, uh, in relating to the, to the Putin government. And it has, a real, uh, it, it has a real echo to the situation here in the US where the church in Russia, as is the case with many of the religious groups here in the US, are using, thinking of and using religion as a kind of uh, index or a stand-in for national identity and identity movements and for race and things like that. Um, and it's really a very troubling set of uh, developments uh, in Russia, but something that's just not covered and not understood by the media on the outside. Uh, then something that I think will be, I wanted to just spend a moment reflecting with you here, something that I think a lot of people uh, uh, in the mainline church have wondered is, what happened to the mainline church in relation to religion coverage? Why doesn't the mainline church get the coverage that, uh, and the attention that, uh, that the evangelicals get? Uh, many people, for example, my father's generation would look back fondly on, uh, on a time when uh, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, the great Protestant theologian who incidentally was an ordained minister and uh, one of the pre predecessors of the United Church of Christ, appeared on the cover of Time magazine. This was in 1948. Uh, and, and why is it that the mainline church has lost that kind of location, that kind of voice? Well, one of the explanations might come, might be available from, uh, 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 from the uh, Berkeley historian uh, David Hollinger, who suggests that the reason why mainline, uh, the mainline tradition doesn't get coverage is that it's not news anymore. And it's not news anymore because mainline Protestantism won. The values of mainline Protestantism became endemic in the culture through the civil rights movement and through social justice and through social welfare and through social security and, and those sorts of things, that those values that the mainline churches identify with have become so adopted by the culture that the media can't think of the mainline church when it speaks as saying anything new or different. Whereas uh, when the evangelical church speaks, it's something that's really radically different from uh, the expectations that the media have about what religion should be. So instead of uh, Reinhold Niebuhr on the cover of Time Magazine, we have Tony Perkins of the Family Research Council, um, uh, in this case, uh, speaking to the fact that the uh, evangelical church is giving um, Donald Trump a mulligan on his, uh, uh, his dalliance with the porn star. Okay. Next chapter, the digital revolution. Everything that I've talked about has become more uh, intense, more fractured, uh, and sped up in the age of digital media. 
Uh, we know what the we kind of know what the digital revolution means. It means that more and more of the media we consume come to us through media, through digital means. It means that the media can do things that they didn't used to do. They're more interactive than they used to be. People are much more act, much more involved in making their own media and making their own meanings and making their own uh, their own identities than they used to be. And digital media and social media allow that and support that. Um, I'm going to just share one case study of the digital revolution that I've done some work on because I think it's a good way of understanding how the digital media are a more complex and more layered kind of opportunity for what we think of as a religion than, uh, than we, might have, we might have expected or assumed. Post Secret was started, it's a website that was started by, a, by an artist named Frank Warren about 10 years ago, and he began it by uh, circulating advertisements, asking people to send him on a regular old postcard through the mail, a secret anonymously, a secret that they had never shared with anyone else. Uh, and uh, today, now, this has been going for 10 years, uh, there's a post secret in Germany, there's a post secret site in Brazil, it's a worldwide phenomenon. He gets about 300,000 cards a week and he selects 30, and he posts 30 of those cards on Saturday morning, and the viewing of those, they're called Sunday Secrets, have become a kind of destination for uh, people on our campus and, and others. Uh, and most of the secrets, I mean, there are a wide range of things that the secrets are about, but about 20% of them deal with religion. And they tend to be things like this, they tend to be uh, resistive to religion, they tend to be critical, they tend to be questioning, they tend to be laments, they tend to be nostalgic. For example, I wish God missed me like I, wish, like I miss him. Uh, this, is, uh, this says, the real reason I backed out of seminary is that I knew it would destroy my belief in God. And it's uh, pasted over a picture of Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, by the way. Uh, or this one, this is a really heart-wrenching one. This is obviously a photograph of a young child who's died, and the person has written on it, I miss you, I wish that I believed in God so that I could pray for you, but your death confirms that there is no God. The thing about the cards is they're really authentic. They're very authentic, and they're very authentic representations of contemporary life, contemporary enemy, the way religion might or should or should not or no longer has a capacity to to speak to those moments of life that people are engaging in and where they're living their lives. Something that, a kind of expression and a kind of activity that would not have been possible before the digital age. So it's, a, it's an entirely new thing that happens because of what we think of it as digital media. Um, this is Frank Warren, the, uh, the uh, uh, impresario behind Post Secret. Uh, it's developed into kind of a movement. He makes about 60 public appearances a year. He comes through our area three times a year. Uh, people come out in droves, standing room only crowds with microphones. He shows some of the cards. People talk about what they mean to them. Uh, people rarely confess in those meetings. That's not the point. The point of this is not confession. The point of this is understanding and having a sense of affinity and relationship and sensitivity to the kinds of stresses and, str and strains that other people are going through. It's developed an online community. It's developed an on offline community. There are meetups and picnics and there's a post-secret community that gets together. Uh, they have discussion boards where they talk about life and death and all sorts of things. Uh, it was obvious to uh, the people behind Post Secret that religion was an important part of what was going on there, even though it wasn't the majority of the cards. And that's led to a publishing enterprise, a series of books by, uh, by Harper San Francisco. This one is the first one, Confessions of Life, Death, Death and God and Post Secret. Here's another example from social media that might break your stereotype of what digital and social media are about. This is the Harry Potter Alliance. This is a group that began as a fan community around the Harry Potter films, and they would have discussion boards and interactions and talk online about Harry Potter and what Harry Potter meant to them. And then they began talking about the values of Harry Potter, and then they started talking about how the values of Harry Potter ought to be applied to life, and then they started mission projects. So they're digging wells in Africa, sending mission, mission groups to Haiti, meeting up for the purposes of trying to improve the social welfare in the developing world, based on a digital interaction, a digital community that formed 
out of a film, out of being fans of the film. Uh, there are more direct representations, of course, of religion online, uh, many vicarious kinds of religious activities. Uh, Buddhists are very, very active online. This is a, a, a virtual uh, temple tour on one Buddhist site. This is a virtual, virtual Hajj pilgrimage on a Muslim site. Uh, this is a virtual visit to the Wailing Wall on, uh, on the, the Second Life site. Uh, where a woman is visiting the Wailing Wall uh, and her avatar is really inappropriately dressed to do this, but nonetheless, that's what's happening there. <coughs> the online environment also allows for more conventional, uh, more conventional kinds of publications to happen. So this is this is today's version of the of what, what I what was the Wittenberg door when I was younger and a uh, 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 humor religion 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 humor magazine. It's called uh, the Babylon Bee. If you want to look at it, it's hilarious. It's evangelical, and so there's some things about it that come across as fairly conservative. But it's very smart and very astute. And this can find markets, and it can it can pay its own way in a way that older print publications never could. It's something that the digital digital media and the digital sphere allows. Um, digital space also allow for interactions around extending layering media experience. This is a site uh, discussing uh, the the, the uh, uh, current. Uh, uh, Black Mirror series and the kind of religious or spiritual implications of some of the narratives in Black Mirror. Uh, of course, gaming, which is a digital practice as well, has uh, objective has objective and explicit religious imagery as well as more fantastic and exploratory religious imagery in it. Uh, now, media imaginaries. This media sphere that I've been talking about functions in part because it allows one of the saliencies, one of the attractions of it, that allows you to form, uh, to work, it, it allows you to work through the imagination, through uh, uh, non concrete, imaginary kinds of experiences. When Curtis Coates and I uh, set out to do a study of masculinity and the and the relationship between media and religion and masculinity. Uh, we uh, started interviewing men all across the country, as many of you know. Uh, and we found that uh, a broad consensus among almost all the men we, could, we interviewed could be drawn around the idea of masculinity being defined by the three Ps, by provision, protection, and purpose. And it's important to think about this in relation to where I'm going with it, to, to recall that as strongly as those things are felt, they are uh, increasingly difficult to actually express in contemporary culture. Contemporary culture doesn't have the explicit context whereby men can do the three Ps. Provision, yes, because that basically means a man has a job and they support a family or a household or whatever. But protection and purpose, that's a little more, those are a little more obscure and a little more uh, distant from a contemporary life. Protection, for instance, we turn the function of protection over to civil authority in, 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 in organized and civilized societies. And the idea of purpose itself, it's not purpose about anything in particular, it's just the sense of having purpose. And so the men we interviewed were finding it increasingly difficult to express what they saw to be these fundamental dimensions of masculinity through their actual daily lives, through their social relations, their marital relations uh, uh, in, in their actual lived lives. Uh, we also found that it was almost impossible to talk about masculinity without talking about media. People could not say, okay, this is my ideal of masculinity without identifying film, fi film uh, figures in particular uh, and television characters um, as examples of their ideal of masculinity. This meant to us that the idea of masculinity existed somewhere beyond the concrete. It existed somewhere out in an imagined or an aspired space, a space where, where ideals would function or something like that. Um, this became even more obvious to us when we considered the uh, possibility of religious sources or sources in the world of religion for the idea of masculinity. One might have expected, for example, that Jesus would be a masculine model of some kind. It turned out not to be, but we looked to, uh, we, want, we expected, for example, that a film like Mel Gibson's 2004 
uh, the Passion of the Christ would be that, an idea of masculinity. And by the way, uh, it's very, by 19, by 2004, the, the bathrobe epic had changed a lot in its form uh, from the days of Cecil B. DeMille, including a lot more marketing being involved. This is uh, the uh, NASCAR entry for the Passion of the Christ from 2004. Nonetheless, we expected, uh, we expected mas ma the masculinity that was sort of implicit in Passion of the Christ to be something that men would identify with. In fact, Jesus didn't come up at all. None of the men there even thought of Jesus as a good model of masculinity. And in fact, among our evangelical interviewees, one film really stood out as the most often mentioned example of filmic expressions of ideal Christian masculinity, and that was another Mel Gibson film, uh, Braveheart. And men were, we found that the men were reading Braveheart as a domestic drama. They were thinking of Braveheart as an articulation of those a provision, protection, and purpose in an idealized, imaginary context where all of that could work out perfectly. So that's what I mean by immediate, immediate imaginary, is that function of the media to be a space where things we would like to happen which are not possible in real life uh, can come together. And that, that, that mixture between uh, uh, visions and ideals of masculinity and then confrontation with with uh, life and culture is not unique to the US. Uh, this is an example from uh, Wellington, New Zealand, where a mega church uh, called the uh, Destiny Church has organized a Maori haka ceremony. So the men of the Destiny Church have come out, they've put on haka paint, they're surrounding the New Zealand Parliament building to try to cast out the demon of gay rights. At the time that the that the New Zealand Parliament is trying to pass pro-gay marriage legislation. Uh, here's another example. This is from uh, Ghana, the roadside of Ghana, and a, and, and a female uh, uh, evangelist, uh, Rita Boamdong, uh, is doing a whole series on masculinity, and she has created this Jesus meets Rambo image to sort of support them. So these ideas that that things that are not doable in real concrete life are imaginable in the media is a, it, it is, can be motivating, it can, can make things happen. So media imaginaries involve uh, contemporary mythologies, they can float above the fray of, of, of concrete social relations, they can be grounded in myth and nostalgia, not necessarily in social reality, they integrate sensation and belief with values and experience, They're, they can be fluid and flexible, they're very satisfying and they involve a lot of cultural work. So I want to conclude by drawing a connection between this idea of imaginary and contemporary uh, politics and particularly the re religious culture wars. In the era today, in our, the, the era we're experiencing today, uh, within pro both Protestantism and Catholicism, there are, there are emergent kind of culture war discourses that in a way benefit from both the, the kind of structuration and the functioning of media and religion as I've described it, uh, and from the idea of the, of the power of the media imaginary as a kind of source of, of, of value and of motivation and of, of action. And Protestantism, the Dominionism movement, and Catholicism, uh, the militant church movement. And both of them uh, are after the same goal, and that is a reimposition of religious authority on the state. Uh, both of them believe fundamentally that something was lost when states became secularized, and we need to go back to a time when religion, when, when public culture was marked by religion. For Protestants, Protestants examples of this are our friend down in Littleton, who, uh, who, who the baker who's in, before the Supreme Court, uh, Jack Phillips. Uh, in, in Tennessee, a uh, uh, year before last, Kim Davis, the local magistrate who who uh, refused to, uh, to issue uh, licenses for gay weddings and gay marriages. Um, and both of these are embodiments of a kind of an ideal of uh, what they see to be an idealized past, enough they have a nostalgia for a past when the culture was more marked and more determined by religion than it is today. I mean, his historians will tell us that they are wrong about that, that they misunderstood that, that they're kind of creating a past that didn't exist, that that's the value of and the volubility of media space. On the Catholic side, 
A very active figure is Steve Bannon. Now, I know he's kind of faded from the scene for the time being, but he's still out there. And, uh, and he represents a, a, a movement or a set of values and ideas that I, don't, I, I think we, we should be aware of. Uh, the cut line on this photograph, by the way, says, Stephen K. Bannon sought alliances with those in Rome who believe that Pope Francis is taking the Roman Catholic Church in the wrong direction. But one of the things that's less covered about Bannon than it should be is the fact that a large part of his activity and a large part of his project has to do with addressing the Catholic Church and trying to get the Catholic Church involved in, in, uh, uh, in, 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 in his kind of conservative view and his conservative politics. Um, it, Bannon is also a media producer. And so this is a media production it's actually produced by Citizens United Productions, you remember them. Uh, Bannon is the producer and the director. Uh, and it's a film that was released last year called The Torchbearer. And uh, it says, when man stops believing in God, he'll believe anything. That's uh, the, the uh, cut line over there. Um, and you can see Phil Robertson is the, is the, is the um, star, Phil Robertson is uh, the uh, pop, the grandfather figure from Duck Dynasty, and you remember a couple of years ago he was uh, he was uh, in, in the news for his, his views about uh, homosexuality and gay marriage. He's the star of this, and you can see he embodies again that imagination, that concatenation of masculinity, politics, and religion that I've been talking about. Um, he's wearing his Duck Dynasty. Um, uh, 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 bandolero belt of shotgun shells and has the shotgun over his shoulder, but he's also carrying an AK-47 and the Bible. So he's fully armed. He has everything you need. Um, he visits Rome and he reflects in Rome on uh, some of Bannon's, you know, kind of key uh, arguments about the church needing to become more militant. We need to return to a time in the past. Who knows when? He says it's not the medieval period he's talking about, but it sort of sounds like the medieval period. He's talking about. Um, and he says a couple of things that we'll find kind of striking. Here's one. In the film, Robertson says that the Scopes trial, the Scopes monkey trial, on the teaching of evolution, during which H.L. Mencken mocked religious opponents of teaching evolution in schools, was a watershed event that would slowly unravel the bond that wove the creator into the very fabric of American life. God would be cast out of the public square, out of education, out of national discourse, out of the popular culture altogether. Uh, something that I've, is not an opinion I've ever heard before. So. Um, the film uh, that, that combines Robertson presenting an evangelical message of salvation through Jesus with a theory about religion's role in human history and society. Says Robertson, when you take out God as the anchor of your civilization, you open the door to tyranny, and instead of human rights, you have the will to power of the ruler who makes himself the sole determiner of what is true and just. Might makes right. More specifically, it's a warning to Americans that society is not grounded in reverence or fear of the Judeo-Christian God and his teachings on right and wrong inevitably descend into depravity and into brutality. And again, it's in, it's in the, the, the special space, the special province of media articulation and media cir circulation that incommensurate, contradictory kinds of ideas and readings of history can be made and brought together in kind of, uh, in, in, into a kind of perfection. Uh, and this helps to explain the fact and the functioning of the media helps to explain what seems to be contradictions such as the one represented in this, uh, in this program. So, I don't leave you on a completely down note about media, though. Don't forget, media also do things like this. <laughs> so, yeah, all kinds of things are possible. Um, so the big picture, as I said before, I've been talking about the shift in the location of religion from histories, doctrines, and confessions to the media marketplace, along a wide range of dimensions. And I look at, and my colleagues and I look at more dimensions and more phenomena than the ones we've, that I've talked about tonight. Tomorrow morning at the workshop, for instance, we'll be hearing about Muslim feminism and young Muslim feminists and how they use digital media. Uh, we'll be hearing about the relationship between Protestantism and the evolution of advertising and how advertising is essentially, uh, essentially something that grew out of American Protestantism. And we'll be hearing about the Orthodox Church in Eastern Europe and its use of media. We'll be hearing about American evangelicalism. And we'll be hearing about 
emerging theological podcasting, and podcasting is a new, uh, a new uh, cutting edge, a new growing edge of American theological reflection. So, what do we do about any of this? Uh, a lot of what I've talked about is inevitable, and we don't have a lot of options, uh, except to engage and try to understand it. And so that's what I do professionally. I think we all should be involved in that exploration. Thank you. I've left some time for questions, so uh, if we have it. Can you hear me? Yeah. I think we can all agree that Stephen Colbert has had a terrific year. And I'm wondering what your comments are about the late night of Stephen Colbert and his very openness about being Roman Catholic. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the slides that I cut out of the presentation was about uh, 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 comedy shows and the uh, comedy uh, shows, and, and that during the period when there was more and more kind of alternative religion showing up in popular media and it was becoming more and more diffuse, late night and particularly Colbert and John Stewart and places like that were the only place where you, and to an extent, The Simpsons and South Park were places where you got actually serious reflection on the nature of religion and its relationship to American society and culture. Um, journalism wasn't doing it, but it was in the comedy shows, which is where that, where that was happening. Specifically about Colbert. Um, what can you say about him? He's very honest about his faith. He's critical of the church when he needs to be. Um, he's someone who has a very sophisticated understanding of not only his own religion, but other religions. So for me, he's kind of a model of how religion journalism ought to be done in American television, uh, and is rarely done. You think about when he talks to God and, you know, <laughs> he has that movie. He's God in the sky. I love it. I just think it's great. Yeah. Um, you, know, it's, it, you know, it's about, it's the kind of thing that we ought to be more familiar with, ought to happen more, and ought to be more comfortable with. I mean, what he's, what he's doing is the kind of thing that if the media had been more um, comfortable is the only word I can use, I can think of, with religion and with the role of religion in American culture all along, that's the kind of thing that would have happened a lot more in the past. But American media have tended to be so suspicious of, so worried about religion that that just hasn't happened until recently. But it's a, I think it's a great model. I like it whenever it does that. So. Thank you so much for the informative lecture. Um, I didn't hear a whole lot, maybe because your your focus is not on that, but on the on the role of huge corporations and the abuse of religion, mm -hmm. as opposed to religion per se. We're dealing with a, for example, I, I'm a Muslim American, and so we have. You know, Islamophobia as a political, socio-economic, political, you know, machination mm -hmm. that pre pretends to want to help Muslims become civilized and be reformed. Mm -hmm. So, to what extent um, you see the imprint of? corporate machination in power as manipulating religion for its own purposes as opposed and keeping away keeping people away from the essence the spiritual essence of religions yeah i can see that i can i can see a couple of ways that i would address it one of them is to say corporations are in the culture like other institutions are and they share the same kind of cultural values and biases that that, that the rest of the culture does, and so they're going to represent that. Uh, I think there's an extent to which the kind of the, the corporate uh, uh, corporatism in the ownership and direction of American media is a growing factor. Uh, media are becoming increasingly commercialized. Uh, 
uh, across the globe. And so the marketplace is more and more determining, you know, what's popular is more and more determining what, what happens. And so uh, the role of corporations in making decisions about which media to buy and which media not to buy is important. Um, I'll also say there is an emerging kind of potential, and this is something that I really worry about, potential politicization through corporate ownership of media that's a real problem. Um, I'm, for instance, quite concerned about Sinclair Broadcasting, as an example, which is a company which owns a lot of local television stations. They have their local TV stations do political commentaries in the local news. Local news is where most Americans get their news. They don't get it from cable news. They don't even get it from national news. They get it from local news. So have a corporation, and Sinclair has bought now one of the Denver stations, so we may soon see some example, some evidence of this kind of activity. Uh, so you'll see increasing corporate involvement. The Koch brothers that we know are very politically active or thinking of or talking about and have already bought a stake in some media corporations. So there, there's reason to be concerned about that. If, if the digital media has usurped some authority of religious institutions. Does digital media also bring people together into community? Yes. Oh. Uh, that was in, in part the point of talking about the, about the hate, about the Harry Potter alliance and about Post Secret. No, that one of, the, one of the things we've really learned about social media is that there's a real tendency for people, sure, they're, they're atomizing in the sense that you can consume media by yourself and you don't have to, and you can have relations, vicarious relations and across, great distance, across great distances, but people still have a real desire to try to connect and be together and to meet up and to form communities. So it's very, what we saw, what I described there in the case of Post Secret and the case of the Harry Potter Alliance, is very, very common for something to start online and end up as a real uh, you know, embodied sort of uh, thing. Uh, the difference is in the media age, that initiative is one that's in your hands as an individual. You're seeking out that community. It's not a community that finds you. And you don't join a free form community, you join a community that you feel you've had some role in forming. So it's more powerful and more motivational for that reason. Now there may be disadvantages to that that we can think about, but nonetheless, there's a, it's not automatically atomizing. So, uh, good question. Yeah. Thank you for a wonderful lecture. I'm wondering if back when you talked about the Pew Center's research and uh, people saying I'm spiritual but not religious. If there's been any thought given to how Ralph Waldo Emerson might have impacted or laid the foundations to that with his individualism, you know, by God and nature. And that, is a, that is an excellent question and a very good point. And yes, there is. A, the, the idea of seeking out spirituality in some context outside uh, the conformist atmosphere of an institution is a deep, deep, deeply rooted American discourse. And Emerson is, is a, one of the most obvious examples of that, but there are many others. Um, and so, yes, th obviously that's a very, the, the people who are, who, are, who are choosing that option are in a long line of American thought about uh, the nature of the individual and about individual autonomy. Stuart, thank you. That was a great uh, lecture tonight. Um, when I think about science and media, I'm being a scientist, you know, I, I think about connecting with science through media. Um, as a kid, my connection started with Star Trek. Yeah. And then um, Carl Sagan and Cosmos, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and so forth, brought me, and I think many that I worked with, closer to science. Do you see media bringing people closer to God? Um, many people would say yes. Many people would say that uh, that the kinds of things that are available, the kind of popularization, the really salient, the really sensate things that media can do to represent the transcendent and to represent uh, spirituality and spiritual presence and things like that can have a capacity to be more influential than other sources of, of that kind of insight and awakening. So uh, I think it's entirely possible, yes. Yeah. Um, the um, United Church of Christ and probably other Protestant churches haven't been particularly media savvy. It's certainly nothing I ever learned about in seminary. Um, the only episode I can think of was 13 years ago, they did these um, commercials, uh, the 
bouncer ads and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. And I was just curious if you thought that those were the still, still speaking okay. initiative. Yes, um, I was on the national uh, committee for still speaking, so I uh, for half the time it was uh, the second half of its existence. Um, uh, I, I could go on and on about the mainline churches and their mistakes in relation to media and mediation. Um, the United Church of Christ, though, I would not paint with quite the same brush as the others in that they had a very active media focus, but it was on media justice, and it was on media reform, and it was on social justice in media, and it worked to increase minority ownership of media. And there were a lot of very, very good things and very justice-oriented things that UCC was involved in, and so that I think the church shouldn't lose its sense that it had that kind of a voice and that kind of space in the face of the past. But overall, and the, you know, the, the other side of, of media mediation for, for mainline Protestantism is another story entirely. Um, I could go on and on about it, I'm writing a book about it, that we'll have a chapter on this. And, and, uh, but I think it's, it, it's clear that the mainline churches and the liberal churches ceded to the, the evangelicals, ceded the public sphere and the media sphere to the evangelicals in the latter part of the 20th century, let it go, let them uh, take it over. Uh, and the fact of the kind of rise of evangelical presence and activity in, in televangelism and all the other kinds of things that they did is part of what accounts for the fact that they have more presence and voice and profile today in the media than the mainline churches have. Uh, so I'm the father of two school age girls, nine and 14. Yeah. And I'm beginning to think that the media is their religion uh, because they, they're so immersed all the time. And my wife and I are constantly battling with them to play a game or you know, do something that you know, actually is interactive. And, you know, um, so my, my question is, um, with younger generations, um, how, uh, because there, there seems to be a leaving of traditional religion, traditional churches from young, with young people, how can the media, or how does the media influence young people in a positive way to find their own spirituality or their own spiritual path? Well, the, the uh, to, to try to be optimistic and positive about it, there's a lot of stuff available and a lot of good stuff. They have to find it, that's the thing. Uh, there's nothing about the practice of social media that necessarily is positive in that in, the, in that regard, because it's it's very personalistic. It, you know, as we all know, it's a, it's prone to bullying. It's prone to rumors. It's prone to it. It doesn't have the kinds of characteristics about the actual embodied practice of media use that you would that, that a church youth group would have, or something like that, or a, or a, a YMCA group, or something. So that that's not there. But in terms of the of the places they can go and the things they can read and the things that they can see, there's a lot. There is a lot of good stuff there. They have to figure out kind of how to get to it. Um, I think there's also something to be said for sort of saying, following your impulses to say, it's not good for necessarily for them to be on all the time. They, they should be spending time doing other things. Um, I don't let my students use their laptops or phones in class. I say, no, nope, you can't do that. Uh, so there are ways in which uh, we can do that as well. Uh, yeah, you mentioned the um, rise in the religious nuns, N-O-N-E-S, nuns, um, and some of the factors in the media that may be driving that. Do you, do you think the media is the primary reason that that group is increasing, or do you have some other... Uh, no, I, no, I don't think so. I think there's a, I think there's a broader kind of set of social conditions that are, that are kind of driving that. I think the media are benefiting from it. They enhance it. They are kind of an additive to it because they they can provide an alternative alternatives for those people so that they can get some of the needs that might traditionally have been met in religion they can get met other ways uh, so the media are active in that process but they're not a primary cause of it they're a, they're kind of a lead a, a, a following indicator rather than a leading indicator of 
that, of that development. I mean, the, the, what's causing it are, are some of the classic things that secularization theory has always said. You know, as, as people become more educated, as they become more, uh, have a better standard of living, et cetera, they don't need, they can do other things, they've got other things to do with their time. They don't need religion in a way that religious activity and religious community in the way that they might have in the past. That's probably a more important driver than something in the media. Thank you. I'm glad that I didn't get the second question. Um, I want to talk about modernity and, and, uh, and how religion, religions have been, uh, have been trying to live with it or not yeah, with it. Yeah. And in the Islamic world, there is a, I mean, he's a uh, human rights activist. Yeah. There is something. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> there is something called, I call it, colonialized um, modernity. Like mm -hmm. modernity poisoned by colonialism. Therefore, as the Islamic world in the mostly East was exposed, to modernity, it wasn't a nice, well-meaning modernity. It was dictatorially imposed by the colonial uh, corporate <laughs> West. Mm -hmm. So people threw the baby in the, with the bathwater in, the, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Islamic fundamentalism mm -hmm. as a reaction to it. Yeah, and and I'm wondering whether whether the the colonial chicken may have come to roost in the so-called civilized West when the, when the modern when the people who go to these horrible mega churches and preach fire and damnation and, 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 and Armageddon they are really duped in a very profound way by a process that fetishizes both modernity and religion mm -hmm. for the purpose of the, in religious terminology, the golden calf. Mm -hmm. To what extent do you see manipulation of the media as a, um, as a mechanism to manipulate the minds and the souls of people who really have a real hunger for something authentic, mm -hmm. except they are being fed garbage mm -hmm. in the name of authenticity. Yeah, uh, that's a big question, and a number of different elements. I would say I, I, I think I, I think you're right in that one of the things to be concerned about is the way that the media manipulate the idea of authenticity. And authenticity is something that's. Uh, that's a very common theme as the media interact with or relate to things that we think of as religion or religious. Um, it's also true that the colonial, uh, we're living with the legacies of the colonial experience in the West and that our ideas of modernity in a way are ideas that are rooted in the particular European traditions of development and of modernity uh, and of, uh, of, of relations and that those involved uh, very, very difficult and very, uh, you know, um, uh, questionable activities in relation to the rest of the world. And now, uh, yes, we we are kind of experiencing uh, the effects of, of, of decades, even centuries, of bad Western uh, Western policy uh, in our relations with the Muslim world and with the developing world in general. We're gonna uh, okay. uh, call it an evening. So Stuart will be downstairs at the reception downstairs in Plymouth Hall. Um, there are also donation baskets at the back for future McKenzie lectures. To get to Plymouth Hall, you can go through these doors to the right and down the stairs. If you go left, you'll find an elevator, which will also take you downstairs. There were refreshments. Stuart will be signing books, and we can continue the conversation. Thank you. What a really Wonderful evening, so interesting, and what a blessing to have you in our midst. Thank you so much, Stuart.